and a very special thank you to Asum because uh, she's looked after all the logistics and the details and everything that this program sort of demands. It's a very demanding program, I know that. What I want to talk about today is actually about um, what is happening to the public university system in India. Um, I don't know if you're aware of how the university system functions in India. We have what are called public universities. So it's only in the last five years that a new sort of phenomena has happened in India, which is the private university. Up until now, we used to have the public funded model for higher education. Much before that, schools, that is primary education and middle education and um, all through high school, students could go to private schools. And those are of course very expensive schools. Gradually what the government was doing in the last 40 years is that they were taking money out of private, uh, public education, that is in, at school level, and that would of course create the perfect atmosphere for private schools to flourish. India is, is, is a country that has huge disparities of income. It has huge disparities between those who have money and those who don't. So one way of ensuring that everyone has access to higher education is through the system of public uh, funded higher education. Gradually, the kind of reforms, and I, I, I use this word reforms very, um, uh, you know, and, and, and I'd like you to sort of pay attention to the kind of reforms that are now being introduced to the university system. Through these reforms, actually, the university is, is sinking. The public university is sinking. And it's sinking, why? It's sinking so that private universities come in, so that uh, foreign universities come in, so this whole new liberal project succeeds. And that's what I'm talking about today. The two crises that I'm talking about, the first crisis is about privatization, autonomy, you know, doing away with the public funded welfare model. And the second thing that I'm going to talk about is that um, as, as it's happening across the world, there is a, there is a strong sort of right wing um, you know, sort of development that's happening all over. And in India also we have a right-wing government and there is an attempt to create a certain kind of an expectation from the university. And this expectation is that universities should now answer to a <coughs> nationalist agenda. That we all have to somewhere prove that we are good Indians, that we are nationalists. And so suddenly in the last two years, professors and students are being called anti-national. And there are charges of sedition against many professors and many students. Then what happens to the university space is, is just part of the state's agenda. And that's, those are the kind of things that I'll be talking about today. The minute we say that it's all right for things to be privatized, then there will be a certain kind of control. There will be corporate control. There will be a kind of demand. There will be an agenda that you're supposed to fulfill. And the ones that will really suffer in this are departments like ours, the humanities and the social sciences. <coughs> so the STEM subjects, the engineering, medicine, etc., they'll thrive because that is something that the industry needs. But subjects like ours, disciplines like ours, English literature, sociology, history, um, all these things are going to slip through the cracks. Because, you know, corporates are not going to want to invest in things like literature. I mean, what are you going to do with literature? What kind of jobs are you going to get with literature? What is the point of studying literature? You, you all just listen to stories, you read poems all the time, you're in la-la land. I mean, what, what is the point? This is not just an attack on uh, political liberty, but also an attack on dissent, critical education, and any public institution that might, exercising, uh, might exercise a democratizing influence on the nation. In this case, the autonomy of institutions such as higher education, particularly public institutions, are threatened as much by state politics as by corporate interests. Now these are the two things that I'm concentrating on. One is corporate interests, which is when we're talking about privatization, and the second is state, state agenda. That, as I started by uh, you know, sort of saying, that I will be talking about how the state also exerts a kind of pressure on universities. This is called the Occupy UGC movement, and this is what students have written on the, on the road. It says education is not for sale, uh, Occupy UGC movement. The UGC is the funding body that gives, that pays professor salaries like mine. So our salaries come from the UGC. The UGC also gives certain fellowships to students. It gives stipends to students. Now, the UGC started, uh, had, uh, had a new policy um, last year, uh, in 2015 actually, uh, wherein students who were getting was also being cut down by the UGC. And that's why there were students from uh, universities in Delhi and later on they were also joined by students from other universities uh, across the country who actually sat 
outside the UGC offices in protest all night. The police came out and they used water cannons on them. They, um, you know, assaulted some students. So it, it was a it was a very very difficult time. This Occupy UGC movement was also very closely linked to the WTO GATS uh, agreement. So the, the, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of this. The WTO GATS uh, agreement says that every all universities, amongst other things, are to be privatized. These are what we call the reserved categories. Like in America, you have the affirmative action. In India, we have what is called reservation. So students who come from um, uh, different, uh, from uh, lower castes, they are called Dalits. The Dalits are the, are the uh, 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 people from the lower caste, and these are uh, they have a they have a really long history of social backwardness, and this is a forced backwardness. It's not as if you know there is a difference in any other way, but they have been forced to live out a certain life condition because of the hierarchy that exists between castes. So that the Brahmins and the Kshatriyas and then uh, the uh, Vaishyas and the Shudras, and after that are the Dalits, the Dalits who are you know who were denied education, who were called the untouchables. It was you know sort of considered that you couldn't even touch uh, a Dalit. So now in the last. Uh, a uh, few decades, there, the government of India has ensured that there is reservation. So, we even in universities, we have a, re a reserved quota for students who are coming from these castes because these are students who need that reservation. Many of them, many, many of them are first generation learners. Many of them have parents who are illiterate. And these are students who are only going to be able to attend university, attend college, if they have a certain amount of money. If they have a certain amount of money that the university is going to ensure that they keep getting. And yet, the government is constantly making it easier for corporates to enter into our welfare schemes. In the name of reforms, there are certain things that have been imposed on the university system at Delhi. The first thing is semesterization. Now that, that has been a huge rallying point for many of us, for students and professors alike, because semester, previously what we had was the annual mode, which means that students would take one exam. They would sit one exam at the end of an entire year. Now, I don't know, I mean, it might seem strange for you that what's the big deal about uh, splitting the academic year into two parts. I think you all have semester, right? So you, you're, you're split into two semesters in one year. Whereas in India, we used to have one exam at the end of an entire year. Now, the, the thing with that system was that there are students who, as I said, who are first generation learners. There are students who don't know the English language. There are students who require special help. There are students who would need that entire time to be introduced to the discipline, to know how to write. You need the entire, um, the entire span of the year to ensure that these students are getting something out of their education. Whereas what the semester model does is, it just prepares them for exams. So now what our students are constantly saying is, okay, okay, um, please don't talk about all this. You, you know, let's just get to what is going to come in the exam. So what it does is, it creates, it, it just forces us to create little modules which is what I'm, I, 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 maybe uh, you, you people have experienced this as well. We're constantly racing against time. And in a, in, a, in, a, in a Western privileged country, maybe that's not a problem. But we are, we are talking to students who need time. We are talking to students who need that, uh, that initiation. So increasingly now, this whole idea of what is called the skillification of the university, the vocationalizing of the university. In America, of course, it works through the idea of community colleges. So certain colleges will become community colleges. They will offer vocational courses. Because like I said, literature, studying literature, isn't, isn't going to get you, isn't market friendly, isn't going to get you jobs. So what, what is it that university administration, uh, the, the university administration will say is that, please just create vocationalized courses. Literature, humanities, the arts, these are all things that are not vocational. These are all things that are not going to get jobs. And it's going to, uh, it's going to create a demand for skilled labor. So students now become like factory workers. What can you do? What is your labor? You're, you're not a student who is supposed to think, who's supposed to write, who's supposed to question. You become like, you become a part of the larger labor force. And this is what is happening. In India, we never had that. We had a kind of an informal way that some magazines would carry out a survey and say, this is the best college, or this is the best university. But it was, it was not formalized. Now it's being formalized in very, very dangerous ways. And the dangerous ways are that if a college or a university is ranked A, A plus, and if a university or college is ranked C, 
both, both these categories are in huge amounts of danger. Why? Because the university or the college that's being ranked A+, plus, that's on top of the list, is going to be told, you guys are doing fabulously, you're doing wonderfully, go autonomous. Move out of the university and go and, and take autonomy. And with that autonomy, you'll be able to raise student fees, you'll be able to teach the courses that you want, because currently, the way it's, uh, universities are run, all colleges teach the same course. Now, with the ranking, all this is happening, who are not doing well are going to be told, you're, you're, you're sick universities, you're being declared sick. So, we're going to privatize you in any case. If you're doing fabulously well, you're doing wonderfully well, take autonomy. So, either which way, you're sort of doomed, either which way, you're in trouble. Therefore, it's best to remain a mediocre university. So, some of us say, you know, we don't want those high ranks, we don't want to be, because otherwise we'll be forced into being private universities. That, that's the politics of ranking. So, an entire nationalist agenda is being forced on us. That, you know, and for the first time, universities have become spaces of sedition. They're being called seditious. This young student, whose own father was killed in the war, she came out with this wonderful, uh, you know, sort of Facebook, uh, you know, sort of piece, and she said all this, that I'm not afraid of the ABVP. I will still protest. There were two students' suicides that really rocked the university and rocked the country. Uh, one student is uh, Rohit Vemula, he was from Hyderabad, and one student was Rajni Krish from JNU, um, uh, uh, Delhi. Now, these two students, of course, came from very, very, very poor backgrounds, and they, they were Dalit students, and because of the fund cut because of the violence that they faced from right-wing student groups they were pushed into 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 such a terrible corner that they took their own lives and so this is what and this is what i'd like to end with that this is this is what the university uh, is happening to uh, uh, the university in india today is that this forced crisis whether it's of privatization or whether it's of proving your nationalism is creating this kind of a it's, it's creating these horrors wherein there will be many, many more deaths and there will be fewer and fewer students like the Dalit students that we get who will be able to afford this kind of an education. And this is something that we all, I mean at least in India, we are all thinking about, we are all uh, you know, trying to uh, thwart, we are trying to stop it, we are trying our best to ensure that this doesn't take over our public funded university. Thank you. I'm sorry I overshot.